I hated this movie. Hated, 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 hated this movie. Hated it. Hated every simpering, stupid, vacant, audience-insulting moment of it. Hold my drink. <laughs> I'm sure everyone got the joke. Sally, he would have. But that was said by the legendary film critic Roger Ebert, no longer with us, after he witnessed this particular small fable, simply known as North, which is right here, as part of the Family Road Trip Triple Feature DVD that I picked up recently at Dollar Tree. Yeah. But sadly, it's probably the only way to get this movie on DVD because, simply enough, the only way to actually get it on its own is having to purchase the Choice Collection from Sony, either DVD or Blu-ray, all of which are DVD-Rs and BDRs, but it's not pressed, as it assumes. So I really hope that Mill Creek will take a chance to actually release this on a press Blu-ray, no matter if the quality looks any good. I mean, compression right. They've been known for compression issues here. But they have done some Blu-rays that looks even better than, than ever. Or sometimes even Sony's releases are much more better. But take your pick. Yeah. But of course I had to get it for cheap. Um, anyway, North was based on a 1984 novel by Alan Swambell, who happens to be friends with Reiner. I mean, he's also best known for writing the screenplay of the TV series The Larry Sanders Show. Um, and the fact that they want to collaborate. To come up with something... Um, Quite different from his usual hits, you know, like um, This is Spinal Tap, Stand By Me, The Princess Bride, uh, When Harry Met Sally, and A Few Good Men come to mind, yeah, even The Sure Fane. I mean, I, I could pretty much name it all that he's done. And I guess for, for that particular alone, that he wanted to do something special for. For all families around like he wanted to do like a, a movie for as a family friendly type by having an all-star cast joining in I mean basically simple I mean what it would have been like if you actually have parents of your own that that neglects you and you want to go all around the world to find the perfect parents that can actually give you a lot of conversations get to take you to so many places that you want to go you know, have a lot of fun playing all these games and and do all these activities, do all this other stuff and talk about their days and without being ignored, you know, that that sort of thing. Or even going around, you know, tucking you to bed after a long day, you know, that sort of thing. And you know, actually very nice to to each other. They can do everything they want. Even have your own brother or your own sister or even a pet. I mean, that's what you want in life, you know, because that way things will go for the better. Even if you have to be, you know, an underdog of sorts. You know, you know, things are not perfect, so, I mean, you think you're like, you're the, the kind of kid that's, that has like an average of IQ, of higher scores, or, I mean, and the fact that you're, you know, you're working so hard, you know, going on a play or, you know, playing baseball and do all this other stuff. I mean, you're like the smartest kid of the planet, but I guess sometimes, you know, not many smartest kids out there can have the perfect parents. So I think that's the, the perplex of the story here. Um, now, I have to be honest here, okay? The first time I heard about this film, I remember seeing the teaser trailer when I went to go see Beethoven's Second in theaters at General Cinema in Glendale, California. 
Um, and it had Elijah Wood in it because I love Elijah Wood ever since I saw him in movies like uh, Radio Flyer. And I, I know I saw him in, in Back to the Future Part 2. I mean, he had a small role. Um, but he was also in um, a, a very uh, small movie that I know no one talks about. Um, but it stars uh, Don Johnson and Melody Griffin. Yeah, they were a couple at the time called Paradise. And that was a film that Elijah Wood um, uh, became well known for at the time. And that's where, you know, he, he was becoming big um, later in his career. Um, but yeah, he, he also went on to do The Good Son with Macaulay Colgan, which to me is the worst movie of all time. Not North. Um, I'm sorry. That, um, I was hoping this one's going to be uh, surprisingly better. You know, it, it sounds like a, a unique fantasy. I mean, think about it. I mean, having... A young kid, you know, who gets suddenly uh, ignored, like like he's not there at all, suddenly finds the perfect parents by getting a free agent, has a friend who's a journalist, but uh, unfortunately it goes too far. And then this is where he spends the entire summer around the world finding the perfect parents for him, so that way, you know, everything will go f for the better, if not for the worse. That's what's pretty simple. I mean, I love the fact that it had an all-star cast like Alan Arkin, Dan Aykroyd, Kathy Bates, uh, Faith Ford uh, from the TV show Murphy Brown, uh, Graham Greene from Dances with Wolves. Uh, you got Jason Alexander and Julie Lewis Dreyfus. I mean, both from Seinfeld. I mean, wow. I never thought they would get those because, you know, after all, Castle Rock happens to produce this series from. Rob Reiner's uh, production company. And you even got John Ritter and Abe Bogota. <laughs> so, what a, and of course, even Bruce Willis. I mean, Bruce Willis, I mean, who's been best known for playing John McClane in Die Hard, but of course, you know, he was best known for the TV series uh, Moonlighting, among others. And then, the, um, I guess this was interesting to find out that this was the movie that introduces to child actress uh, Scarlett Johansson because hard to believe, I mean at the time no one even knew who she was and, until films like Ghost World, Lost in Translation, The Girl with a Pure Earring and of course the Marvel films, you know, like Iron Man 2 um, or even the, the Avengers, and she went on to do other particular films, you know, like um, Lucy, uh, as well as um, Ghost in the Shell 2017, which I know that got some critical response at the time. Uh, among others that she's been doing, I mean, she's she's a terrific actress. I know she was also in Home Alone Free, too, and that's another movie that I kind of first discovered her too, <laughs> not knowingly. Um, but I, I gotta say, the concept was pretty, uh, I mean, very clever. I mean, I know it's kind of strange in a way, but I thought that this was a interesting concept. And, and I had a feeling this was going to be a delightful uh, family comedy, and it, and it would work. I mean, even with the witty dialogue that was all written by Ellen Swimbell, a story that wasn't taken so too seriously. I mean, even if they had to throw in some politically incorrect jokes in there, or, or some sorts, or whatever. Um, I wanted to see this in theaters uh, during the summer of 1994, because I know there was a lot of movies coming out at the time, with The Lion King, Forrest Gump, um, the Shadow, Blown Away, Speed, um, God, there was like a lot of films coming out, e even True Lies. Um, but I actually did want to see this one too, because I thought this would be fun, and, you know, and I love Elijah Wood, but the film flopped at the box office, sadly, um, 
by the time this came out, uh, I, I actually went to Six Flags Magic Mountain. So I, I was hoping maybe I was going to go out to see a movie after this, but I couldn't. So we had to spend the entire day going there, you know, having fun. But hey, I know I could. We had to do what we had to do. Um, and sadly, the film bombed at the box office. Um, it was a forty million budget project that they had to do, you know, but it only made like seven million in the U.S. and yeah, it it really hurt it completely. I just didn't realize that a lot of critics hated the film tremendously. I mean, painfully. And it seemed like, you know, Roger Ebert is becoming the biggest shrill of this entire particularly review that he wants up doing it for his uh, latest issue. I mean, and Gene Siskel joined in too, saying, pretty much feeling the same way that he felt. And I, I felt like, geez, I mean, with all the films that they've been reviewing, I mean, come on, was this movie really that bad? Come on, man. Cisco and Ebert had, had went on to shrill themselves by recommending a movie that was particularly the opposite of the worst films of all time. Guess what that film turned out to be? Um, for yours truly, Natural Born Killers. We already had True Romance and California. Why do we need another one? I know this was based on uh, Quentin Tarantino's story here. I mean, he wrote the screenplay. But that's why he went on to do True Romance, which to me is a better film. Directed by uh, a very competent director no longer with us, uh, Tony Scott. Who, like Oliver Stone, I mean, they both had the, the consistency of actually having MTV-style editing with shaky cams. But unlike Tony Scott here, Stone's um, idea of this is just way too much. It, it got completely nauseated. Um, it's hard to, to fall for this film. I tried to get into the story. It just didn't quite click. I mean, basically this whole tremendously hype over it is because there's supporting nihilism through... Um, through the whole media, because that's why they're becoming famous, like like it's Bonnie and Clyde. So, so I hated that movie. I, I know um, my cousin loves the film, so that's cool. But if Cisco and Eber can love that film, then I might as well defend uh, North instead. And there have been a lot of worse films than North, trust me, man. And, and I'm pretty certain there are so many films that not even Roger had seen it. How about The Devil Inside? I clearly walked out of that film. It was painful to watch. I guarantee you, and everyone felt the same way. I mean, maybe a few people probably liked it, but... That's not what we believe, but... I'm sure, I'm sure people probably have that particular reaction themselves. How about movie 43? That is way, way, way worse than North. That had an all-star cast. And it's basically a rip-off of, of the Kentucky Fried movie. Except that film was better. That had a fucking... St I mean, that had a lot of tremendously funny jokes. That film doesn't. And that gets like two cuts. Maybe a few shorts were okay, but not the rest of it. It was embarrassing to watch. And I felt embarrassed for it by the actors themselves. So. But by comparison with North, I mean, because I know comedy is subjected here, this is harmless. I, I bought the actors and the characters, and I even bought the jokes. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm not a political type of guy here, but I got it. I mean, I, I thought this was a pretty clever piece that they had to do. I didn't think it was mean-spirited as, as the critics led you to believe. 
I just think it was just, you know, a small fable. Like like a fairy tale of sorts, but I mean I know it's it's no Princess Bride, okay. Oh, I mean, no doubt, but I just wanted to like it for, for what it's worth, okay? Because I love these actors. I mean, I love how it goes for the sense of humor here. And I kind of like how they were trying to go which way, which forward. And I wasn't insulted. So, especially the first time I saw the movie. And I had to see it for like a couple years later at high school. Um, it was uh, during uh, my, my first year of high school. It was like around 2000. Um, because 1999 passed, it was the the new millennium as we know it. Um, I had a teacher uh, during the last uh, portion of the class, you know, where I usually do homework assignments and or having to go play a computer game after you're finished, because that's what I do. He sometimes plays several movies, and one of the movies he played was North. Because I never saw this movie before. I really wanted to see it. Um, because it's been a long time. I, I, I haven't, I hard to believe I waited so many years for this. When I saw the movie for the first time, I was surprised. I mean, quite different from the teaser. And I know the TV spots I saw later. Um... I really bought the whole thing. I bought the whole premise. I really uh, admired it. I thought uh, Rob Reiner really took uh, the guts to do this, even though this was pretty tough to do. I mean, I mean they had to spend like in several locations having to film each um, setting here and there. I mean, through its budget, and and I think they really uh, challenged it very well. And it also plays as satirical as it could be. You know, it was very, very funny. Um, so, and I thought Elijah Wood really nailed it, too, as um, North. Hey, it, it's fine if you don't like the movie, okay? I mean, it's a main reason why I'm glad, you know, I form my own opinion. And I'm glad there's other people out there that would do the same thing, too. And I'm, I'm not taking anyone's advice here. I'm just saying that. You know, it's your own choice. Um, if you don't like the film, even if you have to follow uh, Ebert's review here, I mean, that's fine, okay? But for those who actually saw the movie for, for themselves, then take it for what it's worth, okay? But if you love the movie, like I do, um, and you're not embarrassed to admit it, no, I'm not, because I, I stand by my ground here. Then I'm pretty certain you're going to agree with me here. But that's okay. It's, it's, it's your own decision. So let's do the review. It stars Elijah Wood, Bruce Willis, John Lovitz, Matthew McCurley, who was later in the movie The, the Little Rascals, for those who don't know. He was actually in commercials too. I, I remember that toy commercial, uh, you know, where they started making all these, uh, those uh, monster drinks and all that. Yeah, if, if you remember that, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you'll find it on YouTube. Uh, Jason Alexander, Julie Lewis Dreyfus, both from Seinfeld, of course. <laughs> Alan Arkin, um, great actor. Yeah, he went on to. Win the the Oscar for Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah, he, he was he's always been a legend. Uh, Dan Aykroyd, uh, Dan Aykroyd from Ghostbusters. He was also in the movie uh, Neighbors and Doctor uh, Detroit and you know, The Great Outdoors. Um, so what else he's been doing? Yep, Reba McIntyre, country music singer, was in the movie Tremors. And I know most recently, Spies in Disguise. And I know she had that TV show. Alexander Golanoff from Die Hard. <laughs> it was great to see him. Um, Kelly McGillis um, from Witness in Top Gun. Which apparently reprised her role in that sort of way. Like a parody of, of her. I kind of love that. 
Graham Green from Dance of the Wolves, Kathy Bates from Misery, which Rob Reiner directed, you know, based on the Stephen King novel, and of course William Goldsman covers the soul. A Pagoda, always been known for playing fish in the TV series uh, Barney Miller. He was also in the movie uh, The Godfather and Godfather Part Two. And of course, he went on to do Good Burger. I love Good Burger. God rest his soul. Faith Ford from, once again, Murphy Brown. John Ritter, always been best known for the TV series uh, Freeze Company as Jack Tripper. And he's been in Problem Child films and a lot of, even films like Skin Deep and Stay Tuned, both of which were underrated gems. Scarlett Johansson, of course, this was her screen debut, long before she went on to have a career of herself. Um, Keon Young, uh, Lauren Tom, the comedian, yeah, I know she's she's everywhere these days, <laughs> um, but she's she's great, very funny. Ben Stein, yes, from uh, Fairless Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> You know, he always talks in a monotone voice, almost boring everyone to death, but he's also a delight and smart and intelligent. And he's been in the, the Wonder Years and and other stuff too. Uh, Taylor Fry, Elena Austin, Jesse Smollett, yes, Jesse Smollett from the TV show uh, Empire. He was also in the Mighty Ducks, too. Um, and yes, he got arrested in, in recent years and got into bigger trouble. Uh, I think we already know the story here. Um, Robert Costanzo, who's been best known for uh, playing that character in Batman the Animated Series. He's done a lot of work. Um, he's always been a great actor. Rosaline Chow, Richard Belser, yeah, from Homicide, uh, the, the, the TV drama that was on NBC, and he's a comedian himself, too. Uh, Alan Swinebell, yeah, since he's the writer, the co-producer as well. Yeah, definitely the co-writer, and he came up with the novel. Um, so he was given a minor role. He looks a little bit like Jeffrey Jones there, too, when I saw him. And Mark Shaman, yes, who's the composer. I'm on uh, several of um, Rob Reiner's films or any other. He also did the score for Castle Rock Entertainment, this production company. That was actually produced a film along with New Line Cinema, you know, taking over after Nielsen Entertainment with Columbia Pictures uh, being the distributor and they got the rights with Alan Swambell and Andrew Schweinman and it's directed by Rob Reiner you know known for his uh, particular work best known for playing Mike Stibick aka Meathead on All in the Family and and He's also the son of legendary comedian and director and writer Carl Reiner. The movie begins when we meet an 11 year old boy named North, played by Elijah Wood, who's basically what he is an underdog. But he is a child prodigy, actually had some great skills in academics, sports, and drama. So he gets to do a lot of great things that he was admired by many of of his teachers and friends and he's, he's actually a very good baseball pitcher too and he has the obedience attitude of a, of a mall but unfortunately not to his parents who are both played by Jason Alexander and Joey Louis Dreyfus which might as well just be George Costanza and <laughs> Elaine Bennis. I mean, they're just going around making all these conversations of what they do. I mean, he actually works 
as a um, a pants company, you know, selling all these jeans, you know, trying to expect all the numbers. Yeah, his his expectation was uh, was number six, and well, his wife basically just talks about what what she does for a living, and also talks about you know all the the rashes that she's been getting. She was trying to find some ointments and all that stuff. So, North was just trying to do his best to actually contact his parents by trying to fake, basically, you know, like he's acting like he can't breathe, you know, like like he's either having a heart attack or, or he's hyperventilating. He keeps hyperventilating a lot until that way he could finally be able to get his attention to them didn't work as it seems. Um, but of course that's where you hear the narration of Bruce Willis because <laughs> apparently he's playing uh, different characters in the film here. Well, particularly by that one bad day that he had, you know, his game turned completely sour. You know, his drama wasn't doing any special to or not to mention he wasn't doing any good um, in his particular work. So what does he do for a living in case to solve his problems? He decided to find a secret spot, which turned out to be somewhere at a shopping mall. Where he get, goes to a, a local department store, I believe, sitting in this easy cozy chair, hoping someone will come up and talk about his problems and why his parents are ignoring him. And that's where he meets uh, Bruce Willis in a pink bunny, <laughs> in a pink Easter bunny suit, <laughs> just giving him some advice about, you know, try to find a way to, to actually contact them in a better way, or if not, well, find a better solution. Find some new parents to replace. And because he also uh, learned about how everyone else out there, because they think, you know, he's all goody goody two shoes here, that all of which came from his friends, um, they all talk about him, you know, saying what he does here and there, and it just seems like quite embarrassing. So the Easter Bunny. <laughs> He recommends North to simply tell his parents how he feels, but if they can't appreciate him, then they really don't deserve him at all. So that's where he gets the help and encouragement by his friend Winchell, played by Matthew McCurdy, um, where he's working on a school paper. North basically devised a plan to actually divorce his parents and hires an ambulance chasing lawyer named Arthur Belt, who's played by John Lovitz. So he, he was assigned to actually file the papers um, by the announcement uh, in the court order. So he'll become a free agent. And that's where we, we get um, Judge Buckle, played by Alan Arkin, and, you know, trying to decide, you know, for the defense and the plaintiff, you know, what they have to to deal with their hearing here. See if, if, if the defense is going to rest here. Because unfortunately, though, when, when Mitchell was, like, sending out all these school paper articles out there, and that's where um, North's parents fainted, and they barely move, they, they couldn't speak at all, so they're all, you know, carried in, into the the courtroom. <laughs> so they, they're like already shocked and stunned and and they refuse to move at all. Like so they were rendered by uh, comatose here. So they cannot object that Judge Buckle grants uh, North's petition by giving him one summer to find new set of parents but if he cannot do it by Labor Day he'll be in, into the orphanage 
So that means they're going to have someone else try to adopt him. Well, I know, because, well, in real life, though, that's where the, that's where the adoption agency is for. <laughs> but I know. So his first stop was in Texas. Um, that's where he meets, um, you know, two couples, um, Pa Tex and Ma Tex, both played by Dan Aykroyd and Reba McIntyre. Their attempt was to actually fat North up, become the primal candidates uh, to take over the entire um, town, so he'd be able to own everything. But they also wanted to make him, you know, a lot fatter, so that way he'll become as rich, as powerful as he could be. Um, unfortunately, he died because of a stampede that he was up. So, I'm almost feeling like you know he's gonna take over his footsteps, and that's where we get to this uh, rousing musical uh, theme that they're going for, which is basically a take on Bonanza. Because <laughs> I got that too. I, I know where Bonanza came from. I never knew that Bonanza actually had a theme song that has lyrics. <laughs> So it has a dance-off over it. <laughs> um, then we meet the sharpshooting cowboy, Gabby, also Willis, um, who apparently, you know, North had seen him before, who thought he was the Easter Bunny, but, of course, um, this is where he was given the advice about how he feels about his new parents. It just didn't work out. Um, he feels like that. You know, he's going to suffer the same problem that Buck did, and he don't want that. So anyway, he decided to move around and just find another uh, location to see if, if maybe the parents over there would be a lot better. But Gabby just gave North a souvenir, which happens to be a silver dollar with a bullet hole that shoot right into the center. So this will be for, for good measure and for for good luck, hoping that he'll be able to find what he's looking for. So his next stop was Hawaii, and that's where we meet uh, Governor Ho along with Mrs. Ho, and they're both played by Keon Young and Lauren Tom. Unfortunately, they couldn't have children of their own, per se, so they were equally enough to adopt him, per se. So he was very overjoyed how this turned out to be. But that is until the governor decided to come up with a new marketing campaign. And that is basically a Capitone style billboard where they had to show North and his ass crack. <laughs> Excuse me, but what is that had to do with my crack. <laughs> oh boy, that 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 really got to me so much too. But uh, the the idea of this too was that because you know everyone who has gone to Hawaii, they were hoping that they want to be able to have a, a free trip and be able to have all the fun they want. You know, going to the beaches and you know meet some hula girls or any other. But they thought this was the perfect way to actually go to uh, Hawaii by actually showing uh, someone's bare bottom. I mean, geez, I mean, I'm surprised they didn't bother to put a billboard sign that shows a woman's breast. <laughs> well, that's a great way to go to Hawaii. So we can see some sexy uh, hula girls. <laughs> that, that was pretty messed up. Um, so, he could, I mean, he couldn't handle the embarrassment that this is going to go on. The fact that they're going to put this in airlines everywhere. So, this was a bad idea. So, he decided, you know, I'm not going to deal with this. So, on the beach, you know, he meets a tourist, you know, like Gabby and, and the Easter Bunny, Willis. Um... You know, he had a metal detector trying to find something hidden inside the, the beach, you know, while someone was just filming a an exercise workout. Um, 
explains that the parents should not rely on children on their own personal gains. So this, just given his particular advice, so hoping, well, this is going to be another journey that he's going to go for. So that's where he went to Alaska, settled into a new village, and that's where we meet the couple, um, both Alaskan, of course, uh, played by Graham Greene and Kathy Bates. They're not given any names, too. That's another thing that, that puzzles me, too, is that they're not given any names of the characters except for maybe, you know, Ma just simply mother and father. Um, I guess that's the idea here. Um, but to make matters worse, um, they had to send their prospective parents of his had to send their elderly grandfather, played by a Bogota, to go out to sea on an ice float. So that way, you know, this was going to be his journey to die with dignity. And that one was pretty, compared to the the, the last scene, of course, with the <laughs> the billboard. This one was incredibly cruel. And I think that's where people kind of felt, you know, pretty sad, too. They, they felt devastated to see um, an elderly grandfather had to be sent out to die. I mean, that that's, that's just not right. That is totally not right at all. If this is exactly what they had to do over there, then uh, that, that is really painful. Very heartless uh, thing to do. So that I have to agree. Unnecessary. Sooner or later, they're going to be sent over there too. <laughs> so anyway, they, they were on the sleigh. You know, just continuing with their adventures. And then that's where he meets um, a sleigh driver. Once again, Willis. Trying to explain about what's going on, that not that everything isn't any good. Then he realized that you know Labor Day is just about to get around the corner here too, and so hoping that he'll still be able to make it in time, maybe so he'll have a chance to meet some other sets of parents around the world, since none of them were working out very well for the first free trips. But it's probably going to take so many other trips. To, to go for like 49 stops for lunch that's where it just keeps going on and on throughout the summer was when North's next family turns out to be Amish which is basically a parody of Witness in a way I mean that's where you see uh, Kelly McGillis um, uh, playing the mother and, and <laughs> Alexander Golnaw playing the father and he was actually showing his <laughs> his kids and, and his entire family like you know she's not my wife she's not my kids she's not my dad that's the thing and and that was <laughs> that was pretty funny too because that you know Norris reaction was just priceless too when he goes around saying hey this looks great I've always dreamt of a life without the ever-present nuisance of electricity uh, uh let me grab something from the plane I seem to have to left my butter churn in the overhead compartment <laughs> And then he just yells to the <laughs> pilots, Fly it! And then <laughs> the plane just flew away as fast as it can. Or, um, also, um, there's even one scene which almost seems a little resembling to um, <laughs> the scene from the movie Airplane, but only this one's done pretty slower. Was that you're f just when they were getting to Alaska because I forgot to mention it here. Um, they almost crashed straight into the airport, but actually they made a a, sleep, a sloping stop, and <laughs> and the, the front bird of the plane just hits um, just a tiny bit of a window shield. And I thought, wow, that was pretty clever. See, you can't do that in a comedy like this nowadays. Unless it's airplane, <laughs> but then we continue with the experience that he's been going through. Like he went to Sayar, where yes, he meets <laughs> two parents, of course, even one with breast. You can't see it because, of course, it's 
It's PG rated. Then he went to China where he's becoming the next ruler and they wanted to give him a hairstyle. Like he's going to be basically the monk. Yeah, <laughs> no way. And then he went to Paris where suddenly he meets his parents just smoking, laughing hysterically while watching several of, get this, Jerry Lewis's comedies. And North is just uh, channel surfing and every single channel is nothing but Jerry Lewis because, get it folks? French love Jerry Lewis. I got the joke. <laughs> well, meanwhile, Rincho, along with um, Arthur, you know, they're just forming a new plan that hoping that now that North is going on his journey to find new parents, even if it kills him, um, they're actually planning on actually having kids uh, take over the world. You know, like now they're going to become, you know, exactly the way the parents had treated them. So now, you know, they're up for the games, you know, it's the kids versus adults mentality here. Um, so it's like, if he finally wins, they're going to be able to rule the entire um, nation here. You know, Winchell is going to become not only the best uh, journalist of all time, he's going to be basically <laughs> the biggest um, tycoon of them all. I mean... He might as well just be the next Donald Trump. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> Maybe even worse. But if that's not the case, though, he also hires a henchman who's going to be challenged uh, to actually uh, kill North. Because after all, he was the one who sent him to actually send out the, the videotape when um, North's original parents was already comatose but now they're already awakened after being <laughs> stuck inside <laughs> a canister you know using them for the Smithsonian Museum yeah they had a news report on that and yeah Ben Stein you know playing the the museum creator to to announce the to actually use them as the pinnacle of of everyone's memory here but the henchman was hired you know, by uh, Winchell to actually um, not only replace these two, but actually having to record a videotape stating that, um, you know, they love North so much and they didn't mean for what they've done. You know, they made so many mistakes, but then deep down of it, though, they decided to make another tape where, uh, where Winchell wanted to suggest to adopt uh, another kid that would take North's place. And yes, this is where they said, we don't want Hugh. And then she says, he's not our son. We want North. So what Winchell did was he decided to come up with his scheme to edit out the tape while the unedited tape has to be stolen, basically, by um, uh, Adam. He was played by Jesse Smollett, who happens to be North's best friend, too. Yeah, he's, I mean, he was the one who wanted to chose him to be the best player, too. Um, okay, and North was um, with Adam, you know, just when he gave him the tape, he says, you know, Adam, what are you doing here? Listen very carefully. I'm not here. You never saw me. We're not having this conversation right now. Got that? Got what? Perfect. <laughs> and this is where he shows the tape, and then he just explains. Well... You haven't seen the tape, or have you? Or, no, you haven't seen it. So, this is the tape. I mean, and all that. <laughs> because he's afraid he's going to get shot. But if you're familiar with uh, other movies where they always do that, too, where you have some pers random person just giving you, you know, the file, and you listen to it, the conversation from him, and then you just walk away. Never to explain or anything like that. Yeah, kind of like one of those spy uh, movies. So that way, you know, he'll be able to be able to stop him for his own game here. But um, anyway, and and this is where 
Since none of things had worked out for North, he finally went to New York City, and that's where we meet, which is definitely the perfect parents, and definitely the right choice, and it could have been the biggest happy ending of them all, the Nelsons, um, which we have um, John Ritter and uh, Faith Forth, both play, playing Ward and, and Donna Nelson. Um, they're very caring and kind um, parents. I mean, they're basically like um, the Leave of the Beaver or the Donna Reed the type of 50s style kind of characters, but they're, you know, they're very nice and they weren't really bad at all. And, and then you also have a brother um, named Bud, who's played by Jesse Ziegler. Yeah, I forgot to mention him. That's okay. And of course, Scarlett Johansson playing Laura Nelson. So, this was a nice family. And, and they even got a dog, too. I mean, they, they got a lot of conversations. Uh, they, they actually went to you know, have fun at, at, um, at a local carnival. And, you know, they, they were playing games like Clue. And, you know, they get to have, like, picnics. They do a lot of a lot of fun. They get to play video games. They get to do a lot of activities. They, they get to do anything exactly the way parents are supposed to do with their kids. And that's what North should have been with the whole time until Winchell had to ruin it all by hiring the henchmen to send out the videotape knowing that, you know, this was the edited version, and then now North had to think fast if, if he either going to stay with uh, the Nelsons or he's just going to go on his own. And apparently he made the decision already. He decided to go on his own, disappear, like, you know, it's not going to happen anymore. I think he should have just stayed with the Nelsons and get this over with, but... But he, he kind of realized that, you know, Winchell's is up to no good. And that's where the henchmen just kept chasing him around, about to shoot him. You know, and, and then, even though he did give the, the coin to the uh, to a hobo, um, he was also getting some hot dogs, too. You know, he just got the videotape from Adam telling him about what's the real footage. So... And that way he had to escape from the henchman who was about to shoot him completely and was ready to to, to run as fast as he can. Went into um, into the, the big rig where it has tons of boxes of, of borscht. Now you think that uh, <laughs> that it was blood that, that the henchman actually shot him in the head when, when his cap fell off. But it actually hits the borscht. The bill, the bullet hole just went straight into the the box of borscht that fell into the <laughs> the cap, and um, Winchell just found out about that it's not blood. <laughs> and I know that was pretty funny because Arthur can say, "I can make a better borscht." <laughs> so then North wants up at a local restaurant, um, just hiding out um, through the boxes of borscht. And um, suddenly he spots a comedian named Joey Fingers. Once, yep, you would have guessed. <laughs> Willis. Um, anyway, um, he, after he was doing his final act, um, you know, supporting NASA. This is a different NASA, not the, the space program. Uh, but it's for, um, I think this is supposed to be for... Um, fire alarms basically so he came in um, he was actually ready in so he could try out um, his new BCR to see if they could play the tape and that's where North finds out the truth that his original parents love him so much and he realized he made a big mistake that he decided to go back all the way to, uh, through the airport until he realized that the airport carrier couldn't, that is until the female attendants uh, at the airport couldn't let him because they said that he was dead. Yeah, this was one of Winchell's schemes, claiming that he is, and 
And that's where a mob of kids started chasing him around until he was being saved by an, a FedEx uh, driver. Yeah, 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 I can say it already. Willis. <laughs> and basically he says, are you some kind of a guardian angel? <laughs> And he just explains, you know, we Federal Express guys are always guardian angels, to be honest, or whatever. So he hides into the box, um, being sent out to his house um, from a dress, and this is where he begins to find where his real parents are. And and it turns out that this was basically a trick. Winchell is the only one that's there, and he tells him that you only got ten minutes to get to your secret spot because he just found out about it because after all he's a journalist so he had to race against time just to make it there hoping that he'll finally be able to stay together only to discover that the henchman was about to shoot him and he did and that turned out to be all a dream Yeah. Didn't think you see that coming, haven't you? <laughs> um, the narrator, as we know, <laughs> uh, he might as well just be just uh, a. He might as well just be, you know, just just say a worker at at the local shopping mall and, and stuff, just dressing up and stuff. So anyway, he takes him home, um, and he finally made it there. To his home, um, he finally made it there, and yes, both his parents were very worried that he wasn't there. Calls the the newspapers, the the cops, and oh, and they they proved themselves that yeah, they were really worried so much that you know they were afraid they were going to lose him. So so now it proves something that yep, they really did care for North the whole time. Maybe it's because you know they. Maybe they just didn't have the time to have a chance to talk to them because they had to deal with their own problems. And that's what North realized something too. Maybe he realized that maybe it just wasn't the time. You know? Why why wasn't he getting all the attention? And he realized that now, you know. Because they worked so hard for a living and and I guess that's probably why you know, maybe they just wasn't having the best time of their lives but so I, I guess I, I can understand that too so they learned something so by the end of it, it you know it turned out to be a, a happy ending and I really bought that too the fact that this movie is now being called one of the worst films ever made is just totally unfortunate because again I just don't get it. You know, I've seen so many worse films out there, even the ones that have a smaller budget. <laughs> North is nothing compared to those. Okay? Nothing. To me, I just thought it was a, a decent but well made uh, fantasy that you know some people will get someone won't weren't but i wouldn't think it's you know as horrible as as everyone would think here i thought it was just a harmless family f comedy but it can go to several ways i mean yes it i mean there are jokes here that kind of goes a bit too far or maybe some jokes that that can get away with it of, of them all Yes, there are scenes that are pretty cruel. I'll, I'll give you that. Um, and I, I know a few others, but I, I bought that. I, I really bought the whole thing. Um, I love the cast. I, I don't feel bad for them. They really got into it, and they really enjoyed it. I can really tell that they're not they're not just phoning it in, like some people would say. I mean, they they played the characters naturally. You know, they're very talented people. Okay, and I thought the writing was pretty smart and clever, even wittier, too. I mean, I wasn't expecting something like The Princess Bride or anything like that. 
but I was expecting it to be just, you know, what it is. Um, you know, a, a guy who just wants to have the perfect parents that he'd be able to have contact to. You know, he doesn't like to be ignored. We all feel that way. It's like, imagine having to read this as a book, you know, as, as a bedtime story. I think this could really um, acknowledge that. I mean, it's strange, but it's it's worth something that you just want to fall asleep to <laughs> after having a tough time. So, uh, nice uh, score by Mark Sharman. I mean, yes, he's also the piano player too. He has a minor role. Um, nice cinematography by Adam Greenberg. I mean, he's been. Um, he has basically had worked on several movies too, mostly the Schwarzenegger films. So he knows how to shoot uh, several of the scenes here. Um, um, I, I know he's now retired, but I, I, I thought it looked pretty beautiful um, looking at um, all the lands um, of all the, um, the countries around that he had to explore. Uh, around the world, I thought that looked really impressive and photographed uh, very well. And um, some nice editing too. I mean, considering how short this film is, I mean, eighty-seven minutes. Um, now, um, going for the cast alone, I mean, I thought Elijah Wood really nailed it too. I I, I really felt bad for him that he had to be, you know ignored all the time and, and he wants to you know have the freedom to actually be able to have a lot of attention you know he wants to he wants to know that he exists that's the idea but he's he's a very uh, smart intelligent guy and I love him I mean and he's it's true you know um, I thought Bruce Willis really nailed it completely, the, playing the narrator, you know, and he could play like several characters they like, uh, with tremendous dialogue that he was given. I thought that was really <laughs> amazing. I mean, he, he really nailed it. Um, Malcolm McCurdy, I, I had to say, you know, he was devilishly evil. Um, but he's also intelligent as well, and I mean, he, he's he's very conniving for this particular character. I mean, in fact, this is kind of funny too because I think this is the the character that we could have had in The Good Son instead of Macaulay Culkin. I don't know why they couldn't even bother to cast Matthew McCurley playing the role of uh, Henry. Because I would have saw exactly what the film was going to go for. And maybe the writing could have been better too. If that was the case of you know of a child killer here. But that wasn't done very well. Um, it was nice to see Jason Alexander and Julie Louis-Dreyfus uh, playing in their non-cypher roles. But it's, hey, I, I could definitely see the pattern here. Uh, Alan Arkin, of course, always been hilarious you know he does sometimes steal scenes but not much though he only was there for like one or two you know the beginning and, and the end um, I mean I actually like that moment where <laughs> he was trying to get them attention during the courtroom scene and he actually uh, grabbed in a, <laughs> a, a pail and, and he was just banging on it now back to Norris's parents. I mean, this could have been a strange theory here, but imagine if they actually were Constanza and Venice, you know, and suddenly um, they're joined by with uh, Jerry Seinfeld and Cosmo Kramer. I mean, that would be really tremendously, surprisingly entertaining too to see that come up, because. You know, I, I know Reiner's production company produced it, and he really enjoyed it, and I think this was a great discovery here to, to add them into this film. And again, with the rest of the other cast, you know, like John Ritter, Faith Ford, uh, Dan Aykroyd, Ruba McIntyre, you know, Richard Belser, uh, Graham Greene, Kathy Bates, I mean, 
I mean, they look like they were having fun. I, 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 I think they really nailed it perfectly, and they did what they could. I mean, it, it's it's a small picture, um, and I just feel like you know, people are just dismissing it because they feel like this is just going to be another horrible film, or the way you know, this guy's been treated or anything. Like, like they're expecting, I don't know, like if the, if the world is coming to an end or something. That, that's what I felt, what these, these critical responses are, you know. That's why I consider this movie criminally underrated. I'm definitely defending this because of the, of this particular, you know, out, oddball fantasy that I don't think anyone else could come up with unless they have something better to do. But if you ask me, I think this is a way better film than Trading Mom, also known as The Mommy Markets, which happened to be based on a book, which is basically the same premise as North, except at least North has a lot of witty dialogue. Um, Trading Mom just has nothing. I mean, these kids were just spoiled brats, but then they realized they learned their lesson. So you have Sissy Spacek playing different characters of their of any choice of their moms that they had to pick at the mommy market. Um, and yet you got um, Anna Chomsky from My Girl to be in this. And she's the star. And But then they had to learn their lesson at the end because it's totally predictable that they realized that you know they made a mistake. They realize that they love their mom so much that they're always going to learn better. But yeah, they're going to still pull some pranks and do all this uh, crazy, mean-spirited stuff. I mean, come on. I, I, that's what I don't get. I mean, at least North is a nice kid. He really is. So, for the sake of it, though... Um, I mean, even if you're a big fan of Elijah Wood, I mean, I think you should give this film a chance. I mean, it's not as bad as you think, all right? I know, you know, everyone watched Cisco and Ebert. I had to. Um, I didn't watch it very often, you know, during the course of my childhood, but I had seen it, you know, every once in a while or maybe every now and then, but... But I was lucky to watch it online. I mean, I had to find websites to find, like, rare clips. But, hey, that's what I had to do with him. Plus, I had to record some episodes when he was with Roper. Or Roper had to take over, having some special guests. So, that's what I was dealing with. I mean, speaking of Roper, though, I mean, even he didn't like the film either. And he was even say on his list that, out of all the films on the list, North may be the most difficult to watch from start to finish. I tried twice and failed. Do yourself a favor. Don't even bother. Life is too short. I mean, that's his response. Yeah, well, life is too short, all right? Enjoy while you can. But no doubt about it, I would definitely watch this film countless of times, and I'll still live. I mean, come on. Even I had to survive uh, the Garbage Pill Kids movie. And, and that's horrible. I mean, even I, I actually survived movie 43. I almost couldn't survive uh, the devil inside. But whatever. Different folks come from... Uh, different strokes come from different folks. Well, everyone has their matter opinions here. <laughs> so. so, anyway... It's a long video, but I had to take it. That's North, and I give the film three stars, okay? And just to keep that in mind, don't don't think of it like I'm having bad taste of movies. No, I'm I don't. I love movies, you know. It's nice to actually collect films, you know, so you can watch it anytime you like, and it's nice to be a movie buff and everything, right? You know, I, I have different tastes of films. You know, I could choose whatever I want, even if no one likes it. Or, or there's movies that everyone likes and I don't. So, you know, 
like uh, Mike from like Mike Brown OCP Communications said, life would be a better place if if everybody has their own different opinions. And you know what? Maybe I should take his advice. Better. As long as you know it doesn't create any fights going on. <laughs> okay. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.